why focus on women? I mean, we heard a little bit about why that's, that's so important. If you are going to be focusing on poverty, 77% of the world's poor are women, so that's a nice juicy target, unfortunately, that you can go, go uh, after. Um, and of that number of unbanked that I mentioned, unfortunately, there's again a very significant overlap, roughly 70% of that, uh, that population that is not currently um, ha having access to financial resources is, uh, is uh, made up of women. And you know, we're seeing authorities of you know, no less impressive stature than Goldman Sachs's research department, equity research department, identifying those companies that are in countries that have been able to narrow the income inequality gap between men and women, and seeing those companies, uh, countries as having much higher GDP growth prospects over the next decade, and what are those countries that might be operating in that environment, um, and you know, seeing that as a very exciting investment opportunity. Um, and there's also a lot of growing data on some really interesting linkages between women and performance of both financial institutions as clients and institutions that have more diversity on their boards and in their management tending to make better decisions. Um, I, uh, you may all have seen shortly after the the onset of the credit crisis, um, the financial crisis, uh, Nick Kristoff did a wonderful op-ed piece about what if it had been Lehman Brothers and sisters. And I think there's a lot of data that's, that's really pointing to better decisions being made by more diverse groups um, of, uh, of organizations. WWB was created, uh, or actually was conceived uh, more appropriately, at the first UN conference on human rights for women in Mexico City in 1976 by a group of women who realized, and I've had the pleasure of meeting some people who knew those women at the time and saw, literally saw light bulbs going on over their heads, when they realized that human rights would never be fully achievable for women without economic rights. And so over the course of the next three years, um, Women's World Banking was born. And I think one of the more exciting factors, as I mentioned, as we move into this financial inclusion space, is that the number of mainstream financial organizations that we're working with um, in the developing world who are coming to us and saying, you know, the only growing market in our countries is that base of the pyramid. Can you help us identify ways that we can serve this, this market? So we've very recently had the opportunity to work in China, Nigeria, and are very actively um, in discussions with a number of banks who are quite eager to move into that market in a responsible way. We've been very engaged with uh, 12 microfinance institutions in our network and, and uh, financial institutions around the world in building that, um, that individual lending capacity. How do you make cash flow based loans to companies so that they can grow um, in the context of, uh, of the, the, the micro enterprise? And if all of the issues that have made it very difficult for individuals uh, to, to borrow, if you put those individuals in a rural context and they're, they're, they're farmers, it's almost impossible to get credit as a small farmer. And that becomes even worse if you're a woman farmer. And again, the vast majority of the world's farmers are women. And so we've really rededicated to th ourselves to thinking through how do you make loans to women uh, in, these, in these environments. I think one of the most um, striking personal experiences that I had um, in my time at Women's World Banking was actually quite recently, uh, one of my, uh, our team of market research folks um, and I were in Kibera, uh, the large um, slum in, in Nairobi, and we were doing focus groups with girls between the ages of 11 and 13. And they were quite actually kind of distressingly upfront about this fact, but they said that if they had $10 in their name, that's all they needed, that was money that they were saving that maybe their parents didn't know they were saving, uh, that would be enough to keep them from entering into a transactional sexual relationship with a, typically with an older man in order to finance their education. That's what they needed the money for. Their parents were no longer um, as keen to pay their school fees, and so 
they needed to have this money on their own because they wanted to stay in school. So we've become very excited about the opportunities um, that, that this access to financial, um, financial services for young girls and adolescent girls can bring about. It's really good business for the financial institutions as well to be building long-term clients. We've been working with a, a bank in Sri Lanka that has had a youth savings program for 25 years. And they say that this is the way you build lo loyal clients. This is the way you build loan officers. Um, they've been very, very successful in maintaining that, that group of people who started with them as, as child savers. You know, microinsurance is sort of the new, new thing in, in, our, in our field. And we just felt that we needed to look at the health field in particular. We saw pretty much consistently across our network that the time between the onset of an illness and the seeking of care for that illness varied very dramatically. It was on average three days between the onset of an illness and seeking of illness for a child, five days for, um, uh, for the husband, and nine days for the woman. And if that was a pregnancy-related um, illness, she was probably dead in that, in that period of time. At the same time, we were hearing the women tell us that the number one reason that they had to decapitalize or even liquidate their businesses was to cover those costs or because they were losing days of work as they had to go off and take care of their sick child or their sick spouse. So we piloted, and in this case we worked with Zurich Financial Services as a, a tremendous partner in developing this, this product, as well as their local partner in Jordan and our local partner in Jordan, to develop a product that we called the caregiver because we were hearing this need for time away from the business to. Uh, to, to take care of um, sick uh, family members. The thing that we've just been blown away with, we started the pilot in April of 2010. We've sold over 37,000 policies by the end of September. Had about 12, a little over 1,200 claims have been filed. And fully 50% of those have been for complications due to pregnancy which was not what the women were articulating as a need that they had expected, but you know, a hugely valued need to this institution's um, client base. One of the things that I would just say to many of you in, the, in this audience who have already sort of gotten the mantra about women, that we find we really have to be so, so careful about. It's a, a story that I, I uh, sort of stumbled on in, in Kenya an NGO that many of you may have worked with, a tremendous organization that sort of goes in and tries to make commercially sustainable operations at the grassroots level, um, took a look at the dairy supply chain uh, between Nairobi and Mount Kenya. And for generations, that supply chain had been completely dominated by women. They herded the cows, they milked the cows, they got the milk to market, and then the milk was sold um, in the markets of Nairobi by, by women. And because there wasn't any cold storage along the way, it was really just a, a, a very subsistence uh, level of, of income that was generated. It was only an eight hour turnaround time for the milk. And so it really wasn't commercially viable. This wonderful NGO went in, put in cold chain storage, put it, uh, brought in um, refrigerator trucks, and in relatively quick time, we now had a commercially viable product, 24-hour turnaround time with the milk, and it was really generating income, creating jobs, and it had really taken on a very different char character. Within six months of that having happened, there wasn't a single woman on the supply chain left. And I think that's a critical thing that as we look to sustainability, we always keep our eyes on those unintended consequences and making sure that, that gender stays uh, on, the, on the radar screen.